Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about the regulation of blood pressure and blood volume in the human body. So first, let's just highlight some important terminology. Blood flow is the amount of blood that travels in a vessel over a period of time, and it can be described in milliliters per minute. And if we were talking about all of the vessels in the human body over a specific time or all the blood flow at a time, we'd be talking about the cardiac output. But we know that blood flow can vary to certain areas of the body based on need. Blood pressure is the force per unit area that is exerted on a vessel wall. It's measured in millimeters of mercury. And generally when we measure the blood pressure, we measure the systemic arterial pressure in the largest arteries near the heart. And in, most importantly about blood pressure, we know that um, like other pressure gradients, blood is going to flow forward in a vascular circuit down a pressure gradient. Resistance is the opposition to flow. And um, basically it could be a measure of uh, friction. Um, and, and there are a couple of different things that, that actually can, can, can oppose blood flow. So we'll, we'll just kind of highlight some examples. And generally speaking, just like we mentioned, cardiac output would be blood flow through the entire body. When we talk about resistance, we're generally talking about systemic resistance because the resistance is much higher in the systemic vessels than it is in, for example, the pulmonary vasculature. So um, what we really uh, more often will say is peripheral resistance, and we're talking about systemic. So some examples of sources of resistance include blood viscosity. Viscosity refers to sort of the thickness of the blood, and um, the viscosity increases with polycythemia, which is basically an overproduction of red blood cells, and the viscosity is decreased with anemia, or, uh, or, or, or um, not enough red blood cells. Vessel length can also uh, cause an increase in resistance, so an increase in length will increase the resistance and this makes sense if you think about it because a blood pressure in a child is much lower than a blood pressure in an adult. So in an adult, an adult is much taller, much bigger, so the vessels are longer, so therefore the resistance is greater and the blood pressure will increase. And uh, lastly, we have vessel diameter. And so there's a couple ways to look at the vessel diameter. So um, the more narrow the vessel, the greater the amount of resistance we have, um, but also when we think about blood flow through a vessel, there's sort of two uh, types of flow. Laminar flow is, is what's considered normal, and it's kind of like easy flow. Just everything kind of flows nicely through the vessels in sort of these, these linear streams. And in laminar flow, we have blood flow through the center of the vessel as the fastest and blood flow against the walls as, as a bit slower. Now, uh, when we have vessels that are plagued with atherosclerosis, we actually develop turbulent flow. So um, we note that the, the, the inside lining of the vessel is not necessarily smooth. And so as the, as the blood sort of flows uh, along the inside, it can sort of swirl and tumble, and it increases the resistance of the blood flow through the vessel. So we can describe the relationship between blood flow, blood pressure, and resistance using the following equation. F equals delta P over R. So F refers to the flow. Delta P refers to the pressure gradient measured between two points. That's your blood pressure. And then R refers to the resistance. So what we can see is an increase in the pressure gradient will uh, lead to an increase in flow. And an increase in resistance will lead to a decrease in flow. And we can actually rearrange this equation, just uh, some simple math. If we multiply both sides times R, then we can get F times R equals delta P, which basically is flow times resistance equals the change in pressure. And we can rewrite that equation as something slightly more familiar, which is CO times TPR equals BP, where CO refers to cardiac output, TPR refers to total peripheral resistance, and BP refers to the blood pressure. So what we can see is that if we had an increase in cardiac output with a constant total peripheral resistance, we'd have an increase in blood pressure. And conversely, if we had a constant cardiac output with an increase in total peripheral resistance, we'd also have an increase in blood pressure. Let's also remember that total peripheral resistance is equitable to afterload. And afterload 
if an if the afterload is increased, that means that the blood pressure is increased because the heart has to pump harder against the resistance in order to maintain the same cardiac output. Okay, next let's talk a little bit about the arterial blood pressure, which is based on the compliance or the stretch of the elastic arteries and on the volume of the blood that is being forced into them. So um, anytime that we think of compliance, we think of the ability to expand and fill. So that's why we can sort of equate that to stretch in this case. And, um, and, 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 and really with age, um, decrease in elastic fibers, increase in collagen fibers, reduces the elasticity or the compliance of, of the vessel. So it's just something to kind of keep in mind as far as how that would change over time. Now, blood pressure is measured based on a systolic pressure, which is our peak pressure, or the sort of the maximal pressure, and a diastolic pressure, which would be the residual pressure, or sort of the minimal pressure. So um, if we were to subtract uh, the systolic minus the diastolic, we get our pulse pressure. And so when we, uh, I, I just wanna sort of elaborate on these, 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 uh, these terms just slightly. So on this graph, we're gonna show blood pressure, and we can see that at the very bottom, we have our uh, diastolic pressure at the top, we have our systolic pressure, and we're measuring it over time, and, uh, and, and, and of course, um, if we were to sort of think of the heart contracting with each one of those waves, we're seeing the minimal pressure, maximal pressure, minimal pressure, maximal pressure, and, uh, and it just sort of fluctuates up and down. Now, um, if we were going to measure the blood pressure, just a little sidebar, um, if we were to measure the blood pressure, we would pump the blood pressure cuff up so that it occludes the artery that we're, um, that we're using uh, for our, our example. And once we do that, we don't have the ability to have arterial flow uh, because we've occluded the vessels so there won't be any sloshing of the blood against the, the vessel walls. And then as we slowly release the blood pressure cuff, we allow for a little bit of, of blood flow through, and, uh, and so we'll start to hear that blood flow through at our maximal pressure, and we'll hear that blood flow through until we reach our minimal pressure, and at that point, the flow is constant, and it fills the entire vessel, and, uh, and, and the vessel's not um, necessarily stretching anymore, so at that point, we don't have um, any more sounds to measure the blood pressure, so that's how we can tell where we're at our, our, our systolic and then our diastolic pressure. The other thing that we have to talk about when we talk about arterial blood pressure is the mean arterial blood pressure. And the reason we talk about the MAP or mean arterial pressure is because it actually gives us a more accurate measurement of, of uh, it's sort of an average of the blood pressure over, over time. And, uh, and so because we have sort of a, we have a low point, a high point, a low point, and, and, the, and the pressure is fluctuating over time, we can't really just do an average of the systolic minus the diastolic because the, the pressure between those is not constant. If we start diastolic, we move to systolic, we go back to diastolic. And so to get the most accurate measurement, we want to sort of take into consideration how much time is spent closer to the diastolic pressure than the systolic pressure. So therefore, we use this equation. MAP equals the diastolic pressure plus one-third of the pulse pressure or the pulse pressure divided by three. Now there is more than one equation to calculate MAP, and so um, the, there's there's really more than one right equation. This is just the one that I'm going to use. I think it's the easiest to work with. So we'll start with uh, an example. So let's say our blood pressure is 120 over 80. Well, if we were gonna calculate the MAP, we take the diastolic pressure, which is 80, and then we would add uh, it to the, the pulse pressure. So 120 minus 80 gets us our pulse pressure divided by three, and we get a map of 93. Map of 93 is excellent. Um, it, we really are worried about anything that's uh, a map less than 60. So a map greater than 60 is adequate cardiac output, and um, less than 60 is, is not good enough. Um, less than 60 is in the, in the family of shock. So um, let's take another example of blood pressure that's 80 over 40. We would probably agree that 80 over 40 is not a great blood pressure. So now if we do the calculation again, we start with our diastolic pressure of 40, and we add that to the pulse pressure divided by 3. So 80 minus 40 gets us our pulse pressure divided by 3, which is a map of 53. Uh, and, and that is clearly less than 60. 
So um, that's not a very good blood pressure at all because uh, on average, we're not really maintaining pressure in the arteries to deliver adequate blood to the peripheral tissues and, and, and maintain uh, good perfusion. So MAP of less than 60 is considered shock and, and is considered very bad and MAP greater than 60 is considered adequate. Okay, now that we've set up the parameters for talking about regulation of blood pressure and volume, let's talk about the three ways that we can adjust for an increase or decrease in blood pressure or blood volume. So we are noticing this pattern where we describe local regulation, neural regulation, and hormonal regulation in different body systems in order to explain how the body exerts control over that body system and how it's able to modify the behavior of the system. So starting with local regulation, we can alternatively call local regulation auto-regulation. And basically what we're doing is shunting blood to tissues that are more metabolically active. So it would be fair to say that in metabolically active tissues, there's an increase in oxygen demand and an increase in CO2 production. And so therefore, there will be a, 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 an increase in blood flow to those tissues. So let's consider the example of exercise. In exercise, we would need to increase the blood flow to skeletal muscles because those tissues are metabolically active, but we wouldn't need to have a similar blood flow uh, to the digestive tissues because the digestive system doesn't need to be digesting food while skeletal muscle activity uh, uh, during exercise is occurring. So if we look at, uh, this will be the same scheme that we drew before, we have our arterial, our, um, our meta-arterial or thoroughfare channel, then we have our capillary network, and uh, to enter into the true capillaries, we see that we have our precapillary sphincters. Now in skeletal muscle, because the cells need more oxygen, and they're going to be producing more carbon dioxide, and some other, um, some other things that are going to be uh, present here include nitric oxide, adenosine monophosphate, increase in hydrogen ions, and increase in potassium ions, a whole bunch of other things um, that will actually trigger smooth muscle cell relaxation. And because we have smooth muscle cell relaxation of the precapillary sphincter, we will be able to flow the blood through the true capillaries and have exchange with these metabolically active tissues. But conversely, in the digestive tract, since we won't be needing uh, an increase in oxygen, the question is how does it know that we don't need to, to, to travel the blood through the precapillary sphincters into the true capillaries, well, there's less oxygen being used and there's less carbon dioxide being produced. And so we don't have uh, relaxation of the smooth muscle cells. In fact, we have the opposite. The smooth muscle cells will be contracted and we will shunt the blood through the meta arterial and through a fair channel and not to the true capillaries for exchange. And this is the kind of thing that um, can happen uh, quickly in the short term, we can we can change uh, as needed and um, change back when there's a change in the body. Okay, next let's consider neuroregulation. And in neuroregulation, we typically uh, use uh, neural innervation to modify the blood pressure, blood volume in a more dramatic way because there's been a, a significant decrease. Um, so let's pretend that this uh, our little friend here got stabbed, and um, we know. Uh, that um, he's bleeding and uh, the body knows he's bleeding because there's been a decrease in the main arterial pressure. So um, if we have a decrease in blood volume because of significant blood loss, then um, it, at the level of the, the aorta, where when we're pumping out the blood, we're not going to be pumping out as much blood, which means that we're not going to have as much stretch in the aorta. And so um, let's just sort of think about uh, how we would measure the, the blood pressure and the body would recognize that there's been a decrease. So we're going to use baroreceptors to measure this change in blood pressure. And at the carotid sinuses in the aortic arch, we have these baroreceptors and they travel uh, action potentials via visceral nerves to the medulla. And um, from the, there, the medulla is able to process the information and understand that there's uh, a decrease in baroreceptor firing, and so therefore there must be a decrease in stretch because of a decrease in uh, blood volume or blood pressure. So a decrease in baroreceptor firing leads to a decrease in input in the medulla, which in turn will result in output uh, of the sympathetic division 
of the ANS, and uh, we know that we have um, interaction with the SA and the AV nodal cells um, using sympathetic neurons, and we also have interaction with the vascular smooth muscle cells. So activation at the SA and AV node triggers beta receptors, beta-1 receptors, and um, there we'll get an increase in chronotropy, dromotropy, and inotropy. And um, at the level of the vascular smooth muscle cells, we activate the alpha-1 receptors, and in turn we cause uh, vascular smooth muscle cell contraction. So the combination of these responses should increase cardiac output as well as increasing the afterload to improve the blood pressure and improve the delivery of, of the uh, blood to the necessary tissues. And of course, because our original problem was a decrease in MAP, what we're noticing here is the, the end result of all of our uh, uh, attempts at, at at, at modification will increase the MAP. So we have a negative feedback response associated with neural regulation, right? The, the receptors sense a problem, they send the information to the control center, and then there's effector output that leads to a correction of the original problem that we've observed. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, if we have an increase in CO2 or a decrease in pH, which um, in, in this case we may, we will increase chemoreceptor firing and, and communication with the medulla. And of course, these things will lead to sympathetic activation as well. Um, and in this case, one of the things that we'll use the chemoreceptor activation for is to help to shunt the blood to critical organs. And the critical organs are the brain, the heart, the lungs, and the kidneys. And so when we don't have enough blood, those are the organs we want to ensure have adequate perfusion. Uh, so we'll redirect the blood flow in, in those directions. All right, and the final method of regulation is hormonal regulation. So let's just talk a little bit about hormones. Hormones are chemicals that are made by organs or glands, and they're released into the bloodstream to travel to distant tissues where they usually interact by either a second messenger or by diffusing into the cells and communicating with intracellular receptors. So hormones are basically the endocrine system's version of neurotransmitters. They're just chemicals that function to bind to receptors and, and, and communicate messages, but they tend to work over the longer term. So when there is a problem, uh, such as a decrease in blood pressure or blood volume, we're going to take a little bit longer to activate the hormonal component of regulation, but the hormonal component will be able to affect different, different things that we can affect using neural regulation. So, um, generally speaking, if we have a decrease in blood pressure or blood volume, we get release of angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 has uh, four major effects. One, it causes peripheral vasoconstriction. Two, it causes constriction of the efer interarterial, which is in the kidneys. And, uh, and, and basically, it, it will maintain uh, filtration in the kidneys. And so that's something that we'll be able to elaborate on more when we get to the renal system. We also release antidiuretic hormone, which we know is produced in the hypothalamus, and that's responsible for increasing water reabsorption in the kidneys, so maintaining more water for the body. And, uh, and we'll release aldosterone, which is another hormone, and that hormone is responsible for salt reabsorption in the kidneys. So more salt in the body means more water in the body, so those two things really work together uh, in order to maintain the blood volume. The other thing that we can do is uh, release erythropoietin, which is another hormone that will lead to an increase in blood pressure and volume by increasing red blood cell production. It's important to mention that in these examples that we're giving, we're showing a decrease in blood pressure or volume, but if there was an increase in blood pressure or volume, so above and beyond what's normal for the body, the body will do, uh, the, they ha it has some opposing hormones, um, so primarily it will release atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP, and ANP is gonna oppose the actions of angiotensin II. So basically, release of ANP will lead to peripheral vasodilation, relaxation of the, uh, or, or dilation of the efferent arterial, and inhibition of release of ADH and aldosterone. So it's important to see that we can regulate uh, in multiple different ways and also um, uh, on one side or the other, depending on what the needs of the body are at a, at a particular time. Okay, so that actually covers uh, regulation of blood pressure and volume. Thanks for watching.